Bear County is expanding efforts to fight opioid addiction in our community. Details on their efforts coming up. A fire breaks out on the west side, destroying a convenience store. How customers are reacting to this loss. And we've got good rain chances overnight. Some heavy rain in spots. We're going to talk about that forecast coming up. Live from Case at 12, the news at noon starts right now. And we begin with a child finding a man dead in South Bear County this morning. Investigators say that they believe he was murdered sometime overnight. The crime scene unfolding right now on Sandy Circle and Post Oak View. And that's where we find our Devin Clark. He's standing by live to tell us what the Bear County Sheriff had to say just a few minutes ago. Devin. Well, David and Ursula, all the information that we have right now is preliminary, but we can tell you that the Bear County Sheriff's Office has investigators focusing efforts on that tan house about 20 yards behind me and also the backyard of that house. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says they got the call around 830 this morning and that call came from family members who came by the house on the way to drop kids off at school. They wanted to speak to the 37 year old man who lives here alone. Sheriff Salazar says that a young relative around the age of six years old found him dead in the backyard. Obvious signs of trauma to his body and investigators believe, as you said, that this happened at some point overnight. They did clear the house and did not find any more victims, but says part of the crime scene is also inside of the house. Now, Sheriff Salazar also wanted to emphasize that they do believe that this is a targeted attack, so it's not random. They don't believe that the community at, at large has anything to worry about and they are asking for the public's help. If you have any information on this crime, you are asked to call 335-6070. You can also visit bcsotips at bear.org. Again, bcsotips at bear.org, and you can remain anonymous. For now, reporting live in far south Bear County, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Thank you very much, Devin. We have more developing news this noon, this time out of Seguin, where a two-year investigation has led to the indictment of 21 people on drug trafficking charges. Our Courtney Friedman just got out of a press conference at Seguin Police Department. So, Courtney, understand this is a huge operation that resulted in these arrests. Yeah, absolutely, David. Just huge. And you can see some of what's been collected from these investigations just over the last two years. And this is just a small piece of it. This all started here in Seguin when Seguin police officers noticed an uptick in the methamphetamine arrests and seizures that were happening in their area. They contacted state and federal investigators, and then that led to a two-year investigation starting here, spanning the state of Texas, and then all the way to Mexico. Up until today, 47 people were arrested, and then today, investigators then released the names of 21 more targets, with charges ranging from intent to distribute meth, cocaine, and heroin, aiding in abetting and conspiracy to launder money. Twelve of those people have been arrested and the officers are still searching for several others who are believed to be here, Austin, Fort Worth, and then in Mexico. The DEA, Seguin Police Chief, and Guadalupe County Sheriff all say the main issue by far is meth. Methamphetamine is really the scourge of the country right now. Everything that these gentlemen mentioned is as bad as it is, and what's making it worse is it's able to be produced in a location across the border at quantities and purity levels never seen before in the country. And it's powerful stuff and we are awash in it. Now this is clearly an ongoing situation. We're told there is more news to come within the, la the next three weeks rather. And coming up tonight, we're gonna talk about more of these main players. We'll show you some more of their pictures, talk about who they are and how they are connected to these massive drug operations down in Mexico. For now, I'm reporting live in Seguin. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News, back to you. Thank you, Courtney. More to come on that. Meantime, more to come on the opioid epidemic. It is still a growing problem across the nation. And now Bear County is expanding a treatment program for those addicted to opioids. The medication assisted treatment pilot program will help people who battled opioid addiction behind bars and are now trying to re-enter the community. The program starts when someone is booked and continues all the way until they're released. Today, the Bear County Opioid Task Force is also getting approval for a syringe services program. You have to ask, why is the county investing in initiatives to fight opioid addiction? 
the best way to save somebody's life is to put them on the path to recovery, and we plan to do that. So that's what that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that we're talking about people's lives. That's a brother, a sister, a mother, a father. So uh, there's a humanitarian need here. The third is every time somebody's rearrested, that costs us more money as ta taxpayers. So if the humanitarian rationale doesn't work, it will save us money in the long run. And we've seen that in jurisdiction after jurisdiction. That is the chair of the Bear County Opioid Task Force. People in the medication assisted treatment program are going to be supervised, by the way, by a judge. It looks like the owners of a Westside convenience store will have to start all over again. A fire late last night destroyed their business in the 1300 block of Calabar Road. And as Katrina Weber tells us, it's also a big loss for the people in the neighborhood. They brought out their big guns. Still, firefighters aerial water hoses were no match for the fire inside this West Side convenience store. It had a head start. When we got here, there was fire through the roof, burned out the whole roof. All the flames were like, they, they were so big. All you can hear is just like everything exploding. Curiosity had neighbors back out in the 1300 block of Culebra this morning, where they had seen that huge fire around 930 last night. They wanted to see the ruins of what had been a favorite store known as Food Mart Mom and Pops. These store people are really good to everybody that's over here. Yeah, it's Mom and Pops. These two friends were caught off guard by it all. They say earlier it seemed to be business as usual. I passed by the store earlier from coming to get pizza and, you know, the store was closed and all of a sudden, about 45 minutes later, you know, we smell this went up in flames. Although it says here that the business is open 24 hours a day, firefighters say it was actually closed at the time of the fire and that no one was inside. Because of the fire, there is no inside anymore. Firefighters say what's left of the building is unstable and will have to come down. We've applied a lot of water to make sure everything's out, so there's not going to be anything salvaged but the lot itself. As for how this fire started, that's a question arson investigators will have to answer. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. We have some new details this noon about the arrest of a man who police say killed another man at an apartment complex on the northwest side earlier this year. 22-year-old John Anthony Sherahausen was arrested last night. He is accused of killing 30-year-old Anthony Sanks in the 8800 block of Cinnamon Creek back on January 7th. According to an arrest report, investigators found the victim had been talking to a man with the alias NHC Bobo via Facebook Messenger. Police say they were able to link that account to Sherhausen. The report also states the two men agreed to meet up to, quote, commit a violent crime against someone else. But when Sherhausen showed up, police say he shot and killed the victim instead. The arrest report says the suspect is also being investigated in yet another murder case. The results are in, and those likely to vote in the upcoming elections have spoken. Bear Facts, which is in partnership with KSAT and the Brevard Report, interviewed 651 likely voters to get their takes on a number of issues affecting Bear County and the city of San Antonio. The big takeaway, most people have a positive view of where the city and county are headed, but that doesn't mean there aren't concerns. Homelessness, crime, and health issues are some of the big topics voters are concerned about. We caught up with Mayor Ron Nuremberg today to get his reaction from the first ever Bear Facts poll. It's optimism mixed with a healthy dose of reality that we've got to continue to work hard to create a better future. That's why people want to see investments in public transportation. They want to see us solve a sustainable uh, path for the aquifer protection program. They want to see us continue to address education and poverty issues. Uh, so that's, that's the work that we're doing. It's a grind. You can see the results for yourself right now on KSET.com. And then today at 2.30, we will have analysts from the poll with our very own Steve Spreeser with the guests from Bear Facts and the Rivard Report. That'll be all on KSET.com. Still to come this half hour, Spurs getting further and further away from a playoff spot. Last night, they blew a lead in Denver. Highlights coming up. Another American diagnosed with coronavirus as authorities in China continue to race to prevent more infections. The coronavirus threat continues. The death toll in China is now topping 1,000, 
and Chinese authorities have begun firing officials for their handling of this crisis. Meanwhile, more cases were confirmed on that cruise ship docked off the coast of Japan. ABC's Julie McFarlane has more for us. Overnight, another American diagnosed with coronavirus in San Diego. This as the death toll surpassed a thousand in China. Authorities in China racing to trace the route of the virus's spread to prevent more infections. In Japan, the quarantine cruise ship confirming 135 cases of the virus. At least 21 of those are Americans. Just as of yesterday, they brought us new masks and they want us to now wear these anytime we open the door to get anything. In Hong Kong, health authorities evacuated and quarantined 100 people in an apartment block. After two patients living 10 stories apart tested positive for the virus, raising questions that the virus may have spread through the building's pipes and disturbing images on Chinese social media. Medical teams in hazmat suits apparently dragging a panicked family out of their apartment after they reportedly refused to self-quarantine. Meanwhile, as tens of millions of people in China are under lockdown, everyday routines under strain as fear of the virus sets in. Customers shopping for supplies less frequently, wearing face masks, groceries increasingly wrapped in plastic. This customer says he's trying to reduce the number of shopping trips he makes, buying food for three or four days at a time. But there is also courage. 29-year-old Guo Qiang bravely continuing his work as a delivery man, picking up vital supplies for supermarkets at a time when so many want to stay away. He checks his temperature every day, admitting he's worried and gets nervous when he has a cough. China health authorities report that the rate of new infections has slowed in recent days, but experts warn that underreporting could be the cause. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. More yuk. Look out there. That's just, that's, that's a lot of yuk. That is, uh, looks like Julia McFarlane's accent. Very oh, British. Very British. Oh, okay. Nice. Get it? You saw what I did there? Yeah. I see now. Yeah, not bad. Uh, yeah, we've got cloudy skies, sort of foggy out there too. A little bit of rain coming down. It's going to be a wet go of it as we get into tonight, especially with some heavy rain in the forecast. The aquifer is down a tenth of a foot to 672.3 in your pollen count. No surprise here. Mold has jumped up uh, because that should say mold, not mountain cedar. Because we've seen the wet conditions, mountain cedar is actually low. Ash and elm also low. We'll talk about those rain chances tonight and how much rain we could get out of this. Plus, when does the sun come back? We've got that forecast coming up. This case at Rodeo Remembers is powered by the all-new 2020 Chevy Silverado HD. Many Texas towns have a proud cowboy past, but one town just south of San Antonio, the town of Pleasanton, has staked its claim as the birthplace of the cowboy. It's a claim that dates all the way back to 1720. Until the late 1600s, the Spanish didn't think much of the land that would become Texas. Then the French began to show an interest. So the Spanish decided to settle the Texas frontier by building the missions. How would the missions support themselves? Cattle ranching. And where would be the first mission ranch? Right in between Poteet and Pleasanton, the ranch of the Mission San Jose. And what about those cowboys? In 1821, Mexico declared independence from Spain after a costly war. In need of capital and people, the Mexican government began to encourage foreign settlers. Soon, Americans were moving to a place called Tejas. To handle the herds of this new landscape, the settlers had to learn the skills of the local vaqueros, but they needed a name. So they translated the word vaqueros into English and so became the first cowboys. Whether the first cowboy rode through Pleasanton is anyone's guess, but by the late 1800s, Pleasanton developed a thriving cattle industry. For countless cowboys, it became a main stop on their Kansas cattle drives. As far as Pleasanton's claim, well, there are two facts at work here. Vaqueros worked the first mission ranch and vaqueros were the first cowboys. So maybe Pleasanton is the birthplace of the cowboy. It's so there you have it. Yeah, information. Yeah. Some, some people might argue that, but let them argue. Okay. I'm not going to argue it. Okay. No. I'm not going to argue about the weather either. It is what it is. 46. Yeah, right. there's, there's, there's no denying that uh, mm -mm. This, this will be the ugliest weather of the week. But what I will say, and I've said this all winter, we get 
you know, one day of it. That's it. There's been winters past where we've had like four or five days in a row. What well, was yesterday? Wet weather. Ooh, this oh, is a little okay. different. That was transitional. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it wasn't as cold yesterday. Yeah, today is yeah. cold. Uh, cold. We're at 46 yeah. degrees. It's not warming up at all. We've got a lot of cloud cover, some rain out there, too. Let's take a look at the uh, satellite radar. You'll see that the entire state is underneath clouds at this point. You got some showers. Uh, building across East Texas and some of those build back down into South Texas. We've got a little bit of rain out there. There's still some rain coming out of the sky. You still want your umbrella uh, even this afternoon, although I don't think we're going to see a lot. It's really tonight when the rain really kicks in and we get some heavy rain. Also, some wintry weather out in New Mexico. So this is a, a big system here. Uh, temperature wise, 44 degrees in Seguin, 46 in Gonzales. A little bit of rain there. See some of those showers working through Bear County. 47 in Valley, 48 right now in Del Rio and then around Bear County. Mid 40s. So again, it's just, it's just not going to warm up much today. We're going to be lucky if we get to 50. And I don't even know that we'll get there. There's a look outside right now. You see a couple drops on the live cam. 46, as we mentioned. North northeasterly winds at 15. That means there's wind chill too. Feels like 40 degrees outside here in town. 41 in New Braunfels. 33 in Kerrville. So some pretty significant wind chills to deal with. And as we look through the uh, Doppler radar one more time, you can see those showers that are moving through San Antonio right now, especially on the northwest side. A couple light returns uh, just to the east of San Antonio. Some rain around Seguin, Gonzales moving up towards Austin. There have been a few thunderstorms, but they've stayed well to our north today. Here's the big picture and uh, water vapor shows that our storm system is now on the move. It's starting to move in our direction. And that's going to give us the energy that we need to really ramp up those rain chances tonight. There's moisture in place. We got a lot of it for winter time. So this is going to ring out some pretty good rain totals. I think we could be looking at one to two inches before it's all said and done here in San Antonio. Uh, maybe around an inch. Those bigger numbers are going to be off to the east. And we'll show you that in just a second. Uh, but this afternoon, this is at four o'clock. Not showing a whole lot, just some light showers. As we get into tonight, though, 10 o'clock, notice we start to see an increase in showers and storms and then it really comes together midnight through about 4 a.m. I'd say is a window of when we could get some pretty good rain around here by 6 a.m. We're starting to see the showers and storms move east. Yes, some of this could be out of here by the morning commute, but we're still going to have some rain on the road. It's still going to be wet. I, th I think for tomorrow morning and uh, the clouds stick around probably through about midday and then we'll start to see some clearing west to east. Sun should come out tomorrow afternoon and we'll see uh, warmer temperatures as well. Uh, when we're talking rainfall amounts here, I'd say numbers are going to be half an inch or less out to the west here in San Antonio and it looks like they've uh, brought this back just a little bit as far as the numbers, but one inch uh, possibly here in town and then you'll get some of the bigger numbers as you go north and east. So forecast overnight tonight, uh, temperatures in the 40s, 49 degrees, 10 o'clock, 48, midnight. We'll get that heavy rain midnight to 3 a.m. and then turning into just some showers by tomorrow morning, 46 when we wake up tomorrow morning. 66 though on your Wednesday and 61 on Thursday with sunny skies. Valentine's Day looks good, albeit a little There's cold that. to start. There is that. Some increasing clouds this weekend. We'll get some showers for President's Day next week too. Ooh. You're going to get your wife flowers? Yes, I've already done it. You? Me? We bought something together for Valentine's Day. How romantic. Oh. Thank you. There, there you go. go. New today at 5, early voting for the March 3rd primary is one week away. One person behind it all is Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Kaladin. From running a smooth operation to counting every single vote, Kaladin has 23 years of experience under her belt doing this. Today at 5, she shares some of the rewards and the challenges that come with the job after entertainment tonight. And you might be asking yourself just how the Spurs can blow a 23-point lead in a hurry. Well, we've got the answer for you. Coming up. Hey, the Spurs looking for a solid ride in that four-game losing streak on the rodeo road trip. They had to go without DeMar DeRozan last night. A late scratch had some back spasms. In his place, Lonnie Walker, the fourth, got his first start, or second start in the NBA. LaMarcus Aldridge starts with the three. That's LaMarcus way outside. He had 19 in the first half. Derek White from the opposite corner. And then there's DeJounte Murray with that big steal and slam. That's nice. And then at the end of the first half, look at that. That's a three, but it's a foul, but it's a technical. Yeah, DeJounte got a technical because he hit the guy in the face. But then he goes to the line and shoots free three throws because the guy fouled him before he hit him in the face. 
figure all that out. 67-53 at the break. All right, in the second half, the Spurs get up as by as much as 23, thanks to Trey Lyles, three-pointer. But here we go again. Nuggets go on a 16-2 run, capped off by Monty Morris's buzzer beater three. And we're going to the fourth. Spurs lead down to four. 23 down to four. Fourth quarter, Paul Millsaps, three-pointer, gives the Nuggets their first lead of the game, 102-99. The Nuggets expand their lead to 10 late in the fourth. Jamal Murray with a three. And then the Spurs are down double digits for the first time. This one kind of typifies what went wrong for the entire team when they can't get a offensive rebound and the Nuggets end up coming back from 23 down to take this one, 127-120. So that's five in a row on a real road trip. Not a good trip. Are you sure we're talking about the Spurs? Yeah, Our we, Spurs? Yeah, yeah, we are. Okay. We are. A pair of filmmakers putting on a spotlight, uh, putting a spotlight rather on African-American history. How they're working to make sure that no one forgets those that came before. The U.S. military disclosing a more than 50% increase in the number of cases of traumatic brain injury stemming from Iran's missile attack on a base in Iraq last month. Some are now accusing the Pentagon of delaying the release of information about the brain injuries, especially after it was initially reported that there were no injuries in the attack. ABC's Serena Marshall has more. The Pentagon now saying that 109 service members have been diagnosed with mild traumatic brain injury from the Iranian attack on Al-Assad Air Base in early January. The vast majority of those, 76 of the 109, have already returned to duty in Iraq, but 27 have now been transported for more treatment in Germany, and 21 have been transported to the U.S. The number is a steep climb from the 64 confirmed cases that were reported in late January. Their conditions didn't improve. Some got worse and some had severe enough symptoms that they were uh, transported on for further treatment. The symptoms include headaches, dizziness, sensitivity to light, restlessness and nausea. President Trump, who initially said there were no injuries, brushed off the symptoms of traumatic brain injury as nothing serious. I heard that they had headaches and a couple of other things. No, I don't consider them very serious injuries relative to other injuries that I've seen. I've seen people with no legs and with no arms. I consider them to be really bad injuries. No, I do not consider that to be bad injuries, no. Tehran's attack targeting Al-Assad Air Base, where roughly 1,000 U.S. troops are stationed, came after the U.S. strike that killed Iran's Quds Force commander, Qassam Soleimani, on January 3rd. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper initially said that more than 10 ballistic missiles hit Al-Assad during the strike, but characterized the aftermath as nothing major at the time. Esper told reporters recently the Defense Department is studying ways to prevent brain injuries in combat and to improve diagnoses and treatment. The Pentagon says in some cases, symptoms from traumatic brain injuries don't become apparent for up to a year or even two. Serena Marshall, ABC News, Washington. SeaWorld says trainers will no longer stand or ride on dolphins. The move follows nearly a year of pressure from PETA, but SeaWorld says that had nothing to do with the changes. SeaWorld also insists its practices are not harmful to dolphins. The theme park said it's, quote, continually evolving its animal presentations for both guests and their animals. President Trump wants to put astronauts back on the moon by the year 2024, and his administration is seeking billions of dollars to get that done. The White House releasing its annual budget request on Monday. It includes more than $25 billion for NASA in the 2021 fiscal year. $12.4 billion of that is specifically earmarked for the moon landing program. NASA chief Jim Bridenstine says that the moon mission will be a stepping stone for eventually exploring the planet Mars. Congress still needs to approve the request. The polls are open in New Hampshire, the nation's first primary now underway. The latest opinion surveys have Senator Bernie Sanders as the favorite, but a few candidates have seen a recent surge in energy too. ABC's Trevor Alt has the latest from Manchester. New Hampshire voters are heading to the polls, and in many cases, so are the candidates. Warren! 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 
Right. The first primary officially underway, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who exceeded expectations in Iowa, asked if he believes he'll win tonight. We think so. It feels fantastic. The volunteers are fired up and the energy on the ground is wonderful. What's so the win look like, We're man? encouraged. What? Also riding a significant wave of support, Senator Amy Klobuchar. With her crowd sizes seeing a sharp rise, she also took home the most votes from the first three New Hampshire townships. The midnight polls are any uh, indication we're going to have a pretty good night tonight. The candidate swinging the other direction, former Vice President Joe Biden. While still asking voters to stick with him, the Biden campaign announcing he's headed to South Carolina tonight. He's also downplaying expectations, telling MSNBC. Bernie won this 20 points last time. He's got a next door neighbor advantage and he's got a real enthusiasm going here. And, uh, but, uh, but I still feel good. This is, you know, it's a long haul. Those comments coming after a new national poll showed the VP trailing Senator Bernie Sanders for the first time. And that's as Sanders sits atop the state polls here in New Hampshire and is bringing out huge crowds. Let us go forward. Let us have the largest voter turnout in the history of the New Hampshire primary. Let's win this thing. Let's transform America. Also stealing some of the headlines out of New Hampshire is former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He's not on the ballot here in the state, but he still won the midnight vote in one of the first townships. Trevor Ault, ABC News, Manchester, New Hampshire. Outside with live cam, it is cold, it is damp, it is February. Well, I'm glad we had that live shot from New Hampshire before that because it makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> oh, it was well, really smart. cold there. That, that is true. They're actually saying it's good weather for the primary, which I guess up there that is. It's, it's not snowing now. They just got some snow on the ground. We're dealing with some light rain that's uh, tracking through San Antonio. We're going to see some off and on light showers through the afternoon, and then the big-time rain picks in, uh, kicks in tonight. Let's take a look at the radar, and you'll see uh, what we're looking at here. And the showers starting to become a little more numerous, uh, but everything is very light. Uh, this is not going to amount to much, but it is going to make for some wet roadways and wet travel, even for the evening commute. Probably won't be all that pretty or if you've got errands to run this afternoon. Uh, go ahead and grab the umbrella for sure. You can see some of the showers here in uh, Bear County. And right now, some of the more moderate rain is on the uh, northwest side, so I-10 and uh, 1604 there is where some of the, uh, the, the, again, the moderate rain is falling. 47 degrees, New Braunfels, 46 in Floresville, 41 Bernie Stage, 47 Honda, 38 in Las Mables. Not warming up much today. It's going to stay pretty chilly, and uh, we'll see those temperatures only top out, if we're lucky, at 50 degrees. We'll keep a 40% chance of rain in there, but as we go into tonight, a 70% chance of rain. Some pockets of heavy rain overnight, then we will get some clearing tomorrow. A couple days of nice weather by the end of the week. We'll talk more about that seven day forecast here in just a few minutes. David. Thank you, Justin. Good news for a wireless company. T-Mobile clears another hurdle in the plan to take over a competitor. Why some critics say this could be bad news for consumers, though. Another edition of Creating Black History in SA, where we highlight folks who are doing great things this Black History Month. Devin Clark introduces us to two local filmmakers who have documented decades of history on the east side, how their success with the film grew into a bus tour. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. If you live or work on the city's east side or even downtown, you might not realize the history behind the route that you take or some of the buildings that you pass up. Two filmmakers set out to tell the story of the African-American footprint here in San Antonio. Devin Clark shares their success. San Antonio has a history of really some very strong, courageous, self-determined black women. Judging by their knowledge of black history in San Antonio, you'd never believe Logic, Allah, and Undar Ma'at weren't born and raised here. For me personally, I didn't realize how vast the history was um, from a black perspective here in San Antonio until we really started doing research. Almost three years ago, the two filmmakers set out on a mission. One thing I believe is that we have the responsibility to document and tell our story, and we have to pass that on to our children. And they're doing that through two ways. First, through their film, Walk on the River. We talk about the experience of African Americans here in the Alamo City after slavery and during the times of segregation. 
how people started businesses, how they started schools, um, how they were able to purchase and buy land for homes, and just the overall community experience. One thing we wanted to do was put it in a, in a palatable form. Everybody's not going to read a book, but you can sit and devote an hour and a half to learning through a film or through a movie. Another way to learn is experience. After seeing success with the film, many people wanted to visit some of the places they explored, so they created the Freedom Bus Tour, taking people to 18 historic locations on the east side. Because the city is growing so rapidly, some of these historical buildings are being destroyed and demolished. So before that really happens, we want to just expand upon the knowledge um, and, and make people aware of the significance of some of these locations before they disappear. And of course, I always say people make history. So as we're passing these places, we want to talk about the people that were a part of this location. Right in front of us, um, is the Eugene Coleman underpass. At one point, this area was referred to as the Nebraska Street Death Trap. Mr. Coleman vowed to dedicate a portion of the front page of his newspaper, bringing light to this issue until the city council agreed to do something about it. It serves us now so that we know what has ha happened in the past, but it also creates a blueprint for future generations. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Now, the filmmakers host the bus tour at least one day a month with two rides per day. They also do private tours for things like businesses, family reunions, and Black History Month. You can find more information. It's on our website at ksat.com. And you can find the radar on ksat.com. <laughs> sure can. It'll be your friend today. Check in on where, see where those showers are and those storms are tonight. Uh, we're having one of those backward type days. The high temperature was achieved right at about midnight, 51. And we've been at 46 for about five hours now. Temperature doesn't want to budge. We know it's going to be a chilly day. The records are 85 and 17, by the way. And we said that 85 just uh, three years ago, 2017. A little bit of rainfall out there, probably a trace. But we're going to pick up some significant rainfall, I think, overnight. We're going to talk about that forecast and when it clears out. Coming up. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. The streaming wars continue with talent. Amazon has signed former Hulu CEO Mike Hopkins to lead its prime video and studios arm. Hopkins served as Sony Pictures television chairman since 2017 and as Hulu CEO for four years. Amazon hopes the TV and streaming veteran will elevate the company's digital entertainment efforts. Online retailer Brandless is shutting down operations. It's the first SoftBank Vision Fund backed startup to close its doors. Brandless will lay off 70 people, that's 90% of its staff. The company began about two and a half years ago, but says it wasn't able to survive in the quote, fiercely competitive retail market. And Sony has purchased Insomniac Games for $229 million. The deal was officially announced last August, but the financial details were made public on Monday in Sony's financial reports. Insomniac Games developed Marvel's Spider-Man game for the PS4 and Spyro the Dragon. And that's your Cheddar Business and Tech Update. I'm Tim Stenebeck from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. A federal judge has approved the T-Mobile and Sprint, the rather T-Mobile and Sprint, the 26.5 billion dollar merger. This removes a major obstacle in the wireless shakeup. Several state attorneys general had sued, arguing the merger would cut competition and lead to higher wireless bills. Federal officials, though, have already given their approvals. U.S. businesses sharply cut the number of open jobs in December for the second straight month. It's unusual because it's a sign of weaknesses in otherwise a healthy job market. But the number of available positions dropped 5.4% to 6.4 million. Now, according to the Labor Department, it's still a historically solid number, but the total has fallen by more than 1 million this past year. That's the biggest annual drop since the Great Recession. Job openings are now at their lowest level in two years. Samsung taking the wraps off several new phones and products during its unpacked keynote. One of the highly anticipated products is the Galaxy Z flip phone. Samsung gave us all a sneak peek in a 30 second ad during Oscars 
on Sunday. The commercial shows the phone in action with shots of it flipping open to reveal one large screen. It also shows the phone sitting with the top of the screen facing vertically for a better video chat experience. Always coming up with something new. Well, That's see, it's, it's full circle. We went from flip phones back to flip yeah, phones. See, I'm good. You're, you're all right. Yeah, the flip phone that. generation is, you know. Just got to go dig in the drawer and find it. Got something yeah. they've been wanting. Remember when you had you used to pull up the, pull up yes. the antenna to yes. any receptor? Oh, yeah. Don't get me started with do you remember? Do you remember the first? No, you don't yeah. remember. The, he doesn't remember. He wasn't. I think he was in high school. The I first guess. thing we ever got here at the station was a bag phone. Ah. Bag cell phone. Those were big. It was, in a, it was literally in a bag you carry on your shoulder, and then you'd, you'd zip I it I just open remember this thing that was like a shoebox. Yeah. And, the, and like this that. big block thing yeah. that was like this. Well, that, yeah. That yeah. was, that and was you, the first And your arm, would, your arm would hurt trying to hold this yeah. thing. I, yeah. They're, and it was all battery. We've come a long yeah. way. We have come yeah. a We've very, come a long way. We're very old. Uh, we're doing better in the rainfall department, too. You're not old. <laughs> There's some people got There's, no idea. No. Uh, they don't know what we're talking uh, about. Like, what? <laughs> 3,500 of an inch for February. We are a little bit below average. Doing okay. Uh, since January 1st, we're 2.22. Same story. We're doing okay, but if you factor in the last year's deficit, we could certainly use some more rain. And again, there is some in the forecast. Time lapse shows we've had cloudy skies and more cloudy skies and then some more cloudy skies. Uh, a little bit of rain out there from time to time. You can see some of the drops there. Dew point is at 41. We've got a wind chill of 40, so it's chilly. 42 Bandera, 47 Hondo, 45 Pleasanton, 47 for our friends in New Braunfels. And the uh, temperatures generally in the 40s until you get south. Creaso Springs to Cotula registering temperatures in the 50s right now. But uh, again, the wind chill, you got to factor that in. Uh, that wind's pretty stout and makes it feel like it's in the low 40s, if not 30s out there. And I don't see much improvement through this evening, so it'll stay pretty chilly. Double radar shows we've got some more showers developing here across uh, Bear County. And we've really seen uh, the more moderate rain move right there across I-10 and 1604. Now it's moving up towards Leon Springs. Uh, that's going to cause for some uh, cause some wet roadways. There's going to be some light drizzle even where you're not seeing some of these returns. So it's still going to be pretty damp today. But the main show is going to be tonight when we get our main area of energy starting to move in. And that will really kick up the showers and storms. Right now, we're still behind that cold front that moved through yesterday. So that's keeping things cool and cloudy and somewhat damp. Here's what the future cast looks like. So we'll keep some showers in there through 4 o'clock. But by 10 o'clock, you see things get uh, quite a bit more active, so some showers and storms. And then by 2 a.m., we're looking at a pretty good line here of rain, some of it heavy. There's enough moisture in the atmosphere where we could see these be pretty efficient rain producers. And then by 6 o'clock, just starting to move away here. It moves into our eastern counties, perhaps clearing out by the morning commute. But as I've been saying, there's still going to be some wet roads out there. still probably going to be messy tomorrow morning. Uh, but by tomorrow afternoon, we got the sun kicking in and clouds clearing, so it should be uh, nice. And we'll see temperatures get back into the 60s. As far as rainfall goes, uh, it doesn't look like we're going to see as much as we originally thought, but maybe half an inch to an inch here in San Antonio. And then some bigger tolls as you get up I-35 towards Austin, maybe an inch and a half up to two inches up to our north and east. So uh, hour by hour, or at least every couple of hours, here's the forecast for tonight. 49 degrees by 10 o'clock midnight, 48, 70% chance of rain. I think our highest rain chance is about 3, 4 a.m., 80%. And then by 6 a.m., we're starting to see the rain chances come down. And again, things will quiet down tomorrow. 66 for high, 61 Thursday, 60 on Friday for Valentine's Day, and some increasing clouds this weekend with a few showers by Sunday. Snuggle up weather on Friday. That's good. That's right. <laughs> Great weather to go buy your wife some flowers, Justin. <laughs> All right. We have some late breaking news in South Bear County. Actually, an update. Deputies investigating a deadly shooting just two miles from another deadly shooting we told you about earlier in the show. This happening on Mog, Mog, Mog Forward Road. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says a 45 year old woman is dead and a man is in custody. BCSO says the suspect was caught after he tried to speed away from the scene. He's now being questioned by deputies. The sheriff's office says they don't have reason to believe this deadly shooting is connected to the one on Sandy Circle and Post Oak View. We'll continue to follow it and have an update for you if we get more information. Meantime, Eminem's surprise performance on the Academy Awards 
of his Oscar winning song Lose Yourself has paid off in sales. According to The Hollywood Reporter, initial numbers from Nielsen Music and MRC data show 4,000 downloads of Lose Yourself on Oscar Sunday alone. That's nearly 2,000 percent higher than the day before. The five Oscar-nominated songs all performed on the award show also saw an increase in sales led by Cynthia Arrivo, her track Stand Up from Harriet. We're keeping it all in the family. The daughter of former pro wrestler Dwayne The Rock Johnson sticking with the family business. His daughter Simone Johnson now training to become a WWE fighter. The 18-year-old working out at the WWE Performance Center in Orlando. The Rock is the first third generation wrestler at WWE. He followed his footsteps of his father and his grandfather. Rock said on Instagram he's humbled by his daughter's desire to follow in his footsteps. All right, we're going to head over to SA Live where they're cooking up a Ooh. good show oh, and a good indeed. time. Yes, indeed. <laughs> hey, you know what a good time is? What? Over there at the rodeo. Yes, and you want to know how you can maybe get onto the rodeo grounds for free? Hmm, here's a little hint for you. You need some Spurs gear, and that'll get you into the grounds today. Bundle up, though, if you do, and maybe... Go there with your Valentine's Day. Yes, and speaking of Valentine's yeah. Day, it is of course coming up. We're counting down, it's the final hours. Yep, and Deanna Fisher is here from Fisher and Weezer, and we're gonna be making a lovely Valentine's dinner, but you gotta have a little cocktail to stir things That's off, right? That's right, you always wanna warm things up with a cocktail. So we have a Oaxacan Cosmo for you today, okay. just with a little two ounces tequila, one ounce of our wonderful cherry pomegranate habanero sauce, mm -hmm. a couple of dashes of bitters, and some yummy boozy cherries. Ooh. Boozy cherries. And we're yes. ready to go. Okay, well, yes, cheers. Indeed. Happy cheers. Valentine's. Yes. And right. maybe besides the food and the drinks, maybe you have a little bling, a little gift. Yeah, you know, there's chocolate, there's flowers, and there's always jewelry. We're going to head over to uh, James Avery and learn how to make some of that beautiful jewelry and something that you can make to really personalize a little gift for your Valentine. These are some great, great gift ideas. Speaking of mm -hmm. which... Would you rather get chocolates or flowers? Hmm. Red roses or caramels? Red roses or caramels? I go with chocolate. That's all the question we're going to ask you. The head and a lot more is coming up on SA Live, so stick around. <laughs> 